Get ready to enter a brave new world with your host, Vasant Dar. Brave New World is supported by the Center for Data Science, or CDS, at NYU. If your organization is interested in engaging with CDS through student projects, please email cdsindustry at nyu.edu. COVID has accelerated a decade of change into a year. We'll probably look back at the pre-COVID era and say things like, I can't believe you used to spend hours every day commuting, or gee, I miss the good old days where we could actually touch each other instead of the simulator doing it, even though the simulator is so much better. One thing is certain, COVID accelerated the invasion of technology into our lives in a significant way. Big tech and all kinds of innovative platforms are leading to fundamental changes in the way we live and work. My guest today is Jeff Tieper from Microsoft. Jeff is responsible for the collaboration tools in Microsoft 365, including Microsoft Teams and SharePoint. He's worked in the space for over two decades, including Microsoft's transformation to a cloud-based or a cloud-first company. So he's seen the transformation from the inside, figuring out how to make work work in the post-COVID era. Interestingly, unlike the other big tech companies who've become the bad boys through unbridled exploitation of data and all kinds of anti-competitive behavior, Microsoft has stayed off the hot seat since Satya Nadella took over more than eight years ago. It's equally interesting to see how a big tech behemoth like Microsoft manages to grow in an incredibly complex world where humanity cannot function without technology even for a second. And Microsoft is at the center of the thicket of technology that we use every day without even realizing it. It's come a long way from the days of Control-Alt-Delete. Jeff, welcome to Brave New World. I am delighted to have you on the show. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So Jeff, I'm looking at those Alpine pictures hanging on the wall behind you, and I'm wondering where they're from, although perhaps you're using someone else's office for this conversation. No, actually, I took those. That's I like to go hiking with my wife, and that was when we four or five years ago, went hiking in the Bernays Oberland region in Switzerland. And there was this lake that was unbelievably blue. And so I took a picture of it and that's where that is. Amazing. Yeah, it, it's strange. I was in Switzerland myself in the hiking in the Grindelwald area in October. Absolutely wonderful. So Jeff, you know, you've uh, had an interesting journey. You know, you joined Microsoft as a, as a kid you know, right out of school, you know, with Satya Nadella. I, I recall seeing a picture of you guys, uh, you know, as 20-somethings in T-shirts, you know, and so you've been there, you know, pretty much all your career, as has he. Um, tell us a little bit about your journey, which I think is uh, somewhat unusual these days. Yeah, well, I went to NYU for undergrad, and I uh, started dating my girlfriend, then wife, and wanted to stay in New York and be with her. So I got a job as a developer um, when I was 19 in Manhattan and did that through NYU after. And then I went to graduate school, came back and then uh, switched out to to Microsoft uh, a little. It just turned 30 years at Microsoft a couple weeks ago. How about that? So which which means that you've uh, seen three CEOs during your tenure there. That's right. So three, yeah, three incredible, passionate, intelligent people. And it's been, you know, quite, quite the opportunity to learn. And, um, you know, I think we're better for it. So what, what do you see as the key differences among the three? Like, you know, what, uh, you know, what, what sort of mark did each of them leave on, on the company? Yeah. Um, well, st- Bill clearly was the visionary where, you know, he saw before many other people just, you know, not just the early PC transformation, but successive generations of new waves of technology. You know, we were doing work with streaming video years before it became technically feasible or or cost effective. And so Bill was... Uh, you know, one thing I remember from meeting with Bill many times was that he, 
you know, he was always interested in the hard problem and what was going to be five years out. Uh, and so Bill really pushed us for boldness and vision and ambition. And we still get to meet with Bill from time to time. And, and he, he uh, challenges us on that. Steve, you know, and, and Steve came in and Steve shared Bill's ambition, but there was for good and bad, less in the weeds on the technical details in the company. And that, you know, the company under Bill grew so much that Bill's ability to steer everything together, no person could do that anymore. And so it was good that, you know, you know, the different parts of the company, say the Xbox group and the Windows group got a little, little more independent, if you will. Uh, but Steve pushed, pushed hard, really saw that a lot of the opportunity for huge revenue growth for the company was in the enterprise. You know, the value of technology to a consumer is high, but to an enterprise was incredibly high. And Steve made sure that we added a ton of depth and capabilities. And then Steve... You know, both Bill and Steve in different ways pushed us very early to the cloud. And uh, Bill, from a technical standpoint, you know, he Bill saw that large scale cloud services were going to be a big deal. But Steve got the economic efficiency for the world of us delivering the software every day as opposed to customers running it themselves and upgrading every three to five years. Uh, so Steve, I remember, gave a very key talk at the University of Washington and ran print ads called We're All In, uh, which showed, you know, our product, SharePoint, Office, Windows, all running in the cloud. And we were way a- ahead of, you know, we weren't the only people in the industry doing it, but way ahead of our customers who said, what are you crazy? The cloud's not going to be for enterprises. It'll be for small businesses. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, not to say under Steve and Bill's leadership that we didn't do things that we said, gosh, we wish, looking back with hindsight, we wish we hadn't charged an OEM license for Windows mobile so that we'd have mobile share. You know, Google had a different business model with Android uh, for free, but taking the ads. There were clearly some things you look back and say, well, we should have done that differently. But, you know, under Steve's leadership, the doubling down on the cloud was a transformative thing, including Steve picked Satya to run what became the cloud uh, group at Microsoft and then ultimately prepared Satya to be the CEO. And then Satya, Satya came in as a new leader can do uh, with a little more clean sheet of paper, uh, that there was uh, nothing necessarily sacred in terms of strategy. And, but Satya also realized uh, the culture of the company needed a bit of renewal. So he did many things, uh, but the two biggest ones that stand out for me was revamping the company's mission and strategy to really be cloud first, uh, Windows still being important, but pivoting the strategy very clearly, but then fostering a culture around collaboration and customer and inclusion that, you know, it made a huge difference. There, you know, if you look at Microsoft's innovation, revenue growth, uh, prestige, you know, in the last five, seven years under Satya's leadership, you know, I think he, he, you know, he loves this quote from Peter Drucker, which is culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think that was the key to his leadership is that the cultural renewal of the company. So those would, be, you know, it's, it's, it's unfair to three brilliant, motivated people to simplify their attributes to one thing. But Bill's top ingredient was the technical vision. Steve's top ingredient was the business ambition. And Satya's was uh, the, you know, the cultural renewal. But all three of them did business tech and people in phenomenal ways. Well, you know, the stock price has, like, I I guess, gone up tenfold since Satya took over. So that's cl- been clearly an amazing uh, business strategy. What have the drivers of that been? You know, was it a bunch of things or was it a few key decisions? I think the big thing was cloud. There's several things, but cloud computing greatly expanded the TAM 
uh, the ability to consume technology, the pace of innovation, uh, the relevance of technology to far more people than IT. And we, st- you know, some of these things have been years in the making. So when Satya became CEO, you know, 2014, I think, uh, you know, we had, we had launched uh, our business services, what we now call Microsoft 365, uh, in 2008. So we'd been working that for six years. Azure had been out for a few years. Uh, so I think the biggest the biggest thing was just taking the opportunity to be a cloud leader. And you know, if you look at the changes in strategy, you know, it's sort of you go back to 2014 and say, well, that's like the most obvious strategy deck ever. You say bet on the cloud. Like, <laughs> you know, where's where's the insight? It of seems that? obvious but I think in that, retrospect, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was still ahead of enterprise customers at that time. I think there was three key things we we got right. One is we took our office assets, Office Exchange, SharePoint, and now it's, you know, Teams, and said, of course, those run great on Windows, but those are cross-platform. They run on the web, Mac, Windows, iOS, Android, uh, and we removed the uncertainty and risk of, you know, you know, we could go to customers and say, you can collaborate with anyone, anywhere, on any device, any platform, and it'll be a great experience. And the market said, wow, you get it. You know, sometimes I want to use the web. Some of our employees use Macs. And so that, you know, that was the strategy shift on the app side. On the platform side, similarly, we said, look, we love our assets there, Windows, SQL uh, Server, the Azure Active Directory. But we became open to anybody's software. We ran, you know, we run a lot of Linux in Azure. We run a lot of open source software in Azure. We're big contributors to open source. Ultimately, under Satya's leadership, we acquired GitHub, uh, which was uh, both a great thing to attract developers, but also make a statement to the world that our our cloud platform was open. And then the third thing that I think really made a huge difference was the focus on security and compliance. This is a place where I think we are far, far ahead of, yeah, there's a lot to respect about our, our, our peer group here, you know, be it, you know, Amazon, Google, Salesforce, many, many, many. Uh, but if you look at security and compliance, and we have more data centers than Google Cloud and Amazon combined, our depth of security and compliance capabilities for e-discovery, auditing, data loss perfection, multi-factor authentication, you know, we just we're the clear leader here. And so being open on productivity, being open on platform and being best in class and security, I think those are the three things that positioned us to take advantage of the cloud strategy. Um, And, you know, we've done other things that we could get into like gaming. We have a really good position in gaming, but I think the main thrust of the growth was in the cloud. So, uh, you know, you've talked about strategy and and culture, and you also mentioned mission. And I guess uh, my business school professor hat says what, you know, and I hadn't actually thought of this prior to uh, our talking uh, this morning, but what is Microsoft's mission at the moment. And, and I asked this because, you know, my previous guest was Aswat Damodaran. And, you know, we were talking about big tech and the, the you know various platforms. And, you know, you know, he seemed to think that Facebook, for example, has sort of lost its mission. It, you know, it, its mission seemed to be to sort of connect people together. And it's not clear, you know, what their mission is anymore. And you know, and I see Google's mission, which is, you know, to organize the world's information and make it available. Great mission statement. They're far from doing that yet. They've got a long way to go. You know, how would you characterize Microsoft's mission statement? Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll share it with you in a second. I would say I took a break for a year when Satya became CEO away from product leadership to run corporate strategy for the company. So I could work for Amy Hood, our CFO, being the head of corporate strategy, and got to see what Satya did. I, you know, I... It was great to be a fly on the wall and listen to what he was doing. And he really boiled down the company's worldview, its mission, its cultural attributes and leadership principles 
to a very small list of things and repeated them over and over and over for the first couple of years and really walked the walk in terms of picking leaders that would line up with that. And whereas I'd seen us do some of these exercises before, and it's interesting, sometimes you read other people's leadership principles. I think Amazon has like 11. It's an interesting list. They're all good stuff, but nobody can remember 11 leadership principles. We have three and they're each two words. So you only have to remember six words. So the chance of remembering them is pretty good. So he, he, you know, he obsessed over every word in it. And our mission statement is to empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. So it became a very customer centric mission as opposed to a tech mission or a mission about our business growth that he believed, uh, that our success stemmed from our customers' success. He felt a mission should answer the why, and I'll get to the what in a second, Um, but he really kept it the fewest number of words possible. And the one word that, uh, you know, he got both businesses and organizations in there and consumers with individuals, but the word that people really pushed him on that he could cut was on the planet uh, because it's empower every person and organization on the planet to achieve more. And people said, why do you need that? Like to distinguish from the, (laughs) you know, we're not in outer space. And he said, no, I really want to make sure that our employees know that it's everyone. Uh, So things that are very important personally to Satya, like accessibility and supporting emerging markets, he wanted to make sure that the origin of Microsoft that Bill had seen about democratization of technology was continued to be deeply rooted in the mission that we weren't just a company for tech elites. So that the mission statement answers the why. And then we all sort of lined up in trying to answer the what. So the mission statement for my group, for example, I work on our collaboration tools with Teams and SharePoint is our mission statement is to empower every person in the org- person and organization on the planet to achieve more with industry leading collaboration tools integrated together in a hub for teamwork at school, work and home. And so I, you know, teams like mine lined up our what, which was your know, collaboration our differentiation, which is bringing these different modes of collaboration together in a unique way with the why. And uh, I, you know, I think we walk the walk, the walk. Uh, We started, you know, every presentation I do to my team, every single one starts with customers. Rarely do these days, uh, do I have competitors in my present. In fact, last week with the team's team, we just had our all hands. You would People outside might imagine, say, Jeff's going to get up and say, well, let's talk about Slack and Zoom and what they're doing and Google and what they're doing. And look, we do that analysis. But the thing I started with was, let me tell you about the hospital, the school, the factory, the retail organization that's transforming how they work with teams. And, you know, let's focus on building the best product, the best choice for those customers. So we really... This customer focus and our mission became a very real thing in the last, you know, last several years. It seems like there's incredible complexity involved in achieving what you're trying to achieve, right? You, you've had a, you know, Teams, SharePoint, OneDrive, Office, Viva, all these things, to, you know, that touch different parts of uh, different people's lives. How do you manage all of this complexity and, and, you know, bring it together to support the mission that you're talking about? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of levels to that. Let me try to keep it succinct. Um, You know, it's interesting. This weekend, I reread a book called The Product Book. That's sort of, you know, a recent hot book for aspiring product managers. And they gave the sort of modern best practices of doing product management, you know, customer focus, hypothesis, hypotheses, experimentation, um, finding minimal viable product, finding product market fit, all the, you know, frameworks that across the industry have converged. 
And it was a really good book. And we're, you know, we're, of course, like most tech companies, get people to read it. But I think getting to your question, the thing it didn't fully capture, and I'm not promising to write a book or anything like that, is the scale. When you build products for hundreds of millions of people with thousands of engineers, it's a lot different than, say, the 10-person software team. And so I think the complexity comes at three levels. The customer level, where taking the median of a billion users is an, an uninteresting thing. You have to recognize a product like Excel serves very different people from somebody adding three numbers as fast as possible to investment banker building a sophisticated model. So one is just having a understanding of the range of customers you're doing, addressing, and making sure you can deliver simplicity and flexibility. So that's complexity one is the customer. Complexity two is the architecture. Uh, this sort of move fast and break things works again and is the right playbook for a very small company. You have thousands of engineers building siloed uh, microservices. The software collapses on, uh, on its own weight. So good architecture and engineering is actually pretty key to velocity and having just enough of architecture so that you have a stable, reliable system for customers and you have engineering productivity, but not so much that you're always retiring technical bet and uh, not delivering new value. That's sort of an art. And then the third one is the organization dynamic. Uh, you want to both empower teams to deliver new. Yeah, in fact, you know, I'll give you an example in my own group. So we have communications experiences in teams, chat and calling and so forth. And we have content management capabilities in SharePoint, document collaboration, building websites, tracking lists. Uh, those come together in a unique way for customers. If we so empowered those teams that they could use their own design language and their own information architecture, and it showed up in a product and it was a bit of a Frankenstein, we'd be delivering a mess for customers and kind of undermining a key part of our differentiation. So I think those would be the three main things, which is You've got a broad range of customers. You need good architecture, but you can't have it be the, it's a means to an end. And then you need a way to balance alignment and empowerment in a large organization that, you know, neither stifles innovation nor creates chaos. Thanks for that simple summary of complexity, Jeff. Very artful. I was concerned that my question was sort of in the twilight zone. Was, no, no. It, your question was the core of my job. <laughs> if I'm micromanaging team A or team B in my or, in my team, then I'm stifling innovation. If I'm above the fray and just letting everybody run, then you know chaos will ensue. So I think it's the core of my job, which is to manage the complexity. So you know, talking about work, you know, you took over teams, I believe, shortly. Sort of in, just before, just, ten, 10 days before. 10 days before the <laughs> pandemic. Yeah, great timing. Yes. So, you know, I recall at that time using Zoom that seemed like far and away the best tool. And I must say that over the last year and a half, I've used Teams more and more, and it feels much better than it used to uh, at, at the beginning of the pandemic. You know, and I also noticed that Zoom's share price is about a sixth of what it was at the height of the pandemic, which makes me wonder whether the market thinks that, you know, they're going to get you know, eaten up at some point. I just want to sort of take a step back and ask you, we've seen this sort of brave new world of, you know, just work being transformed in a in a really short space of time where, you know, we've probably seen 10 years worth of change in a year. What are you seeing, you know, as someone who heads one of the key products that enables work? How has work fundamentally changed forever, you know, relative to what it used to be? And what does that mean? for tools for collaboration? I think what we've seen in the last two years with the pandemic has sort of hit us in uh, three waves. First was the rapid transition to the cloud. You know, let me say a lot of the things that are going on are things that we and others in tech have been talking about for many years. Do cloud-based collaboration on any device with anyone, synchronous and asynchronous. You go back in time and look at these words. 
Uh, you could, you know, Ray Ozzy, who worked at Microsoft for a while, uh, invented something called Lotus Notes many years ago. And Ray used some of these words and people didn't understand them at the time. And so maybe it takes like two decades for the rest of the planet to catch up. But so the first catalyst was companies had no choice but to go to the cloud. Their on-premises PBX video conference capabilities were never, ever designed for keeping their organizations functioning fully remote in meetings. For people that work on plans and documents and access business applications, uh, you had to have remote access. So the first few months were about all these norms, uh, like you said, 10 years in a year, uh, where there were, you know, our team's adoption, I think I'm going to, I'm going to get these numbers not quite right. I, but, but our last published number pre pandemic was 20 million daily active users. And Recently, we published 270 monthly active users. So you can sort of quibble with the metrics, but you know it really was 10x users, 20 to 50x minutes, and companies just were consumed, both companies and individuals were con- consumed by that. The second wave was around what I'd call synchronous and asynchronous. At first, everything moved to meetings. Uh, eight hours a day, 10 hours a day in a meeting like this. And because there was no playbook, people had FOMO. They wanted, you know, they were worried about their career. They were worried about connections with other people. Nobody knew how the economy was going to go. How long was this going to last? And so a lot of companies really continued to overuse meetings and, and, and past the breaking point. And we saw, you know, people's, you know, team by team, company by company concluding one, like, let's not make meetings the only tool in the toolbox. Let's use asynchronous collaboration, chats, channels, real-time document co-authoring integrated with meetings and have the meetings be as efficient as possible. Uh, And, you know, I wrote, I published something on LinkedIn, what we did in our team when we hit this discovery of sort of, you know, getting to a more balanced approach. And now the Third wave is, I think, about the well-being and sustainability of people. And that's come from a few things. One is people were just exhausted in a lot of different ways through this. Uh, Two is the market for talent has been extremely hot. And three, people experienced a bit different work-life balance working from home that they don't want to give it all back. And so we, you mentioned one of our newest products that we released last year called Viva, which is a family of applications built on teams for employee growth, well-being, learning, uh, connections. Uh, and, you know, it was really motivated by a lot of customer discussions that you can no longer play pay lip service to employee engagement uh, and health you know, you won't get the most out of them if you do that. And the market for talent where people can work from anywhere is such that they will walk out to the, walk out the door to a company that they think is a better culture. So that's, uh, you know, I think, you know, we're now, you know, those are the three things we've been through. I think we're about to really start to experience this hybrid thing where different teams and companies and sub teams are going to be a mix of remote and in person. And uh, we have to all be humble and have grace in learning how that works for different people. And I'm not in the camp that everything will be full remote all the time staying forever, but hybrid's going to be hard because you're going to have to really, really work hard to be inclusive of not favoring the people who are in the shared physical location. So I think that's the fourth thing that we're all wrestling with now. Now, that's an interesting challenge to find the right balance that empowers people to borrow a word from your mission statement. Some people are incredibly productive and happy working remotely, while others need that human touch. I think it would be highly suboptimal to apply a uniform work rule, especially after people have had some real experience now working in different ways. But at the same time, you can't have complete anarchy, can you? Yes. And I don't think there'll be company A that's a full remote 
company and company B that's a full in-person company that the world sorts themselves into those two buckets. I, I think there'll be all companies will have to be more flexible of different work styles. And, you know, we are in a bunch of different ways, baking that into teams to try to support these more inclusive, natural ways of interacting, regardless of where you are. What's your data telling you so far as to how this whole thing is working? You know, do you do you measure things like engagement and the efficiency or effectiveness of collaboration? I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing that academics would love to measure and probably write a paper five or 10 years from now, but you're in the middle of this and seeing this. And in fact, we do. Uh, if you go search on Work Trends Index, uh, we have a site with research. Uh, we have uh, PhDs in our team and Microsoft Research that have worked with universities uh, to put a scientific method around this uh, and garner data and insights. And this is the kind of thing that it needs to be living research because how people feel today is different than three months ago and three months from now is going to be different. And uh, I think we have another update that that coming in the next few days. I shouldn't foreshadow the, the details, but I can share that the things we did publish that uh, just two data points that we call the hybrid hy- hybrid paradox. One is about three quarters of people feel they are more productive from home at least a fair amount of the time. And so that says, wow, three quarters of the people are liking some aspect of that. But then two thirds of the people say they're deeply missing human connections for their emotional well-being and the productivity of the work group. And you'd look at those numbers and say, well, those add up to more than 100. So clearly some people are saying this is a good deal, but we're missing stuff. Um, and, and so this leads us to going from the extreme of full remote, which is what most people filling out those surveys and the research we've done have lived in the last two years to, okay, what if you went in two days a week? Or what if you went in three days for planning sessions once a month? Would that be the ideal medium? What if, you know, you got into a a rhythm of meetings where you had your daily stand-up, your weekly project review, your monthly business review, and then your quarterly, you know, big strategic planning review? What if you got in this nice predictable rhythm as opposed to the chaos of meetings springing up ad hoc? So I think we're we're in a lab and it is it is a place where uh, scientific and academic research is helpful. And this is why uh, there's a you know, one of our chief applied scientists, uh, Jamie Teven, a brilliant woman who's a, a peer of mine. Uh, she and her team works with Microsoft Research to help us be grounded in, how, in the methodology in which we, we research this stuff, because it, we can't just say, well, what do you think? You know, there, <laughs> we need to be a little more disciplined about that, that, the research we do here. Yeah, no, that's, so, uh, you know, very, very interesting because this is not a either or kind of a thing. You know, it's not like one is better than the other. So it reminds me of this Yogi Berra quote about, you know, you come to a fork in the road, take it. So, you know, people obviously yes. like both things and would like both of these going forward. As you were speaking, you know, I I was thinking about things that have become so much more efficient being remote, things like doctor's visits, right, which used to take, you know, a a morning, right, just getting there and waiting and then coming back. And and I guess the, the implication of all this is that people will need to plan their work better into these things where remote is obviously better versus things where face-to-face is obviously more effective. Yeah, and and going back to the use, you know, from the very beginning, teams sort of blended these different modes of collaboration together because we really did believe not everything, sometimes you need to get together and have a, a deeper discussion, and sometimes it's way more efficient than naturally scheduling an hour-long meeting just to have a side chat on something or in a, have it in a public channel where you could have a new member of a team catch up. And so we we definitely see this in the data that 
companies had too many meetings for a while because it was the only tool in the toolbox for remote. They were by default an hour long because that was what people naturally did. And people talked to fill, you know, very frankly, just talked to fill the time or read the slides. And there was like five minutes at the end for discussion. And we see companies saying, let's do two things. Let's really have purposeful, efficient meetings. You know, is this an education session? Is it a decision-making session? Let's get pre-read out to people. Let's not read slides to people for 55 minutes before we have a five-minute decision-making window. And then let's get things out of an hour-long meeting that could be in a you know, two-minute channel conversation that, again, people outside the meeting, not ev- you, ha- you do something in a meeting, everybody has to be there. And the meeting gets bigger, and when meetings get bigger, they get worse. Whereas if you have something in a digital channel, say the marketing launch channel, everybody can see that and at least know what's going on. And you don't have to have all these status meetings for things that could, people could read in like one tenth the time. Uh, so we, we definitely see that backed up by the data. Interesting. Yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. So I want to come back to culture and, you know, another thing you mentioned with the tight market for talent. And one of the books you sort of recommended that I read, which I did prior to this conversation, was the one called The Alliance by Reid Hoffman and his co-authors, you know, which I thought was really interesting. And it sort of begins with this fundamental change from the era of lifetime employment to short-term contracts, right? Uh, And he sort of described the culture at LinkedIn where it's expected that people will move on to other jobs and other companies. It's just just sort of part of the culture and, and it's discussed freely and openly. To what extent has that culture permeated Microsoft? Uh, In other words, has the acquisition of LinkedIn had an impact on Microsoft's culture? Yeah, uh, I think, you know, it's been really fascinating to learn from, you know, Reed and Jeff Wiener, who was the CEO of LinkedIn for a while, and now Ryan Wislanski, uh, you know, learn from GitHub. um, And I, you know, I think they've also learned from from Microsoft, you know, there was a reason Microsoft was successful and in a position to acquire those companies under Satya's leadership. And so I think, you know, the phrase Satya has emphasized uh, the book uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck uh, is growth mindset that there is, I think old Microsoft felt very proud of the complexity of waterfall engineering of shipping software in all in one day uh, that, you know, you'd go work for three years in the windows org and you'd ship, ship the product uh, or office. And we were really better at large scale software than anybody else. But then, you know, the size of the market attracted a lot of talent, you know, technical advances reduced the cost of entering the software market, mobile, et cetera. Um, and, it became more clear that there was, you know, lots of opportunity to learn. So absolutely, we've learned from LinkedIn and GitHub and smaller acquisitions. And I think the way we've tried to, you know, again, there's some people who have love their life's work. So we have people in our team in SharePoint who love file systems and they just dream of building the perfect file system and honing the kernel and the networking protocols and making that as fast as possible. And they just love their job and the notion of doing other things, you know, of course they want to learn from others, but they're, they're really happy. And then there's other people who say, look, I just want lots of different experiences. And we just hired somebody in the team's organization. Uh, Actually, I'll give you some examples. We hired an engineering leader from the Xbox team. We just hired uh, our consumer product manager lead from uh, for teams from uh, Facebook. They've been working on the newsfeed there. The leader of the overall team's consumer effort, uh, Monik Gupta, came to us. Uh, he had been previously chief product officer from Uber. So both externally and internally, we want to attract all sorts of talent with different perspectives and learn from them. We're having this product manager session this week. Uh, where all the product managers in the company will get to go to a training session. And that includes outside speakers like Scott Belsky, who runs product at Adobe, but also internal speakers and uh, 
Amit, the head of product for Teams Consumer, who came to us from Facebook, is organizing the event. You know, we didn't have some longtime Microsoft person do it. So we are very much trying to be the at the forefront of learning from everybody in tech. And regardless of whether you want to work on the same thing for 30 years or a year and move around, we want to be a great place for, for everybody. So, you know, talking about learning from others, I'm trying to learn about what this, uh, the, the, the metaverse is going to look like, you know, and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we know exactly. Every detail, we've got it all figured out. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It's like, it's, there's no ambiguity right. I, whatsoever. I, I mean, I'm reminded of Elon Musk's uh, <laughs> comment that, you know, he's yet to see a definition uh, of it. So someone please define it. Um, so will you please do that uh, for us? Can you uh, give us your take on it? Yeah, I think there's a, there's an, I, and I, I'm not, uh, this is not precisely the official Microsoft point of view, but I'll give you sort of roughly how I think about it. One is there is a loose definition, which is a virtual immersive space where people can get together and interact and collaborate and play and create. So by that definition, uh, that looser definition, Minecraft is a metaverse. You can go into Minecraft, create worlds, interact with others, etc. Teams is a metaverse that you can go create a project team with documents and chats and meetings and collaborate with people anywhere in the world uh, and so forth. Uh, And it can be immersive in that it's, you know, that Minecraft one is 3D on a traditional PC screen and the Teams one is, you know, video calling. And that's sort of a loose definition, but it is totally fair in these things for people to say, well, that's not precise enough. And so they tend to uh, add a few things. And that's where I say, we'll see. One they add is a you know, virtual reality headset. And virtual reality headsets will come to gaming. They will come to productivity. They already are. We have you know, our work in HoloLens and you'll see, you'll see more. I personally don't think it's a hard rule that without a headset on, it's not a metaverse. In fact, I think for you to be able to join these immersive spaces on a traditional laptop or phone is just fine. And that's how most people will do it most of the time. So the strict definition, does it include the headset or not? I don't think so. The second is uh, distributed ownership, the DAO, if you will, that, uh, you know, there's been a concern about, you know, central ownership of things. Yeah. The web started out, is a set of protocols, Tim, you know, that evolved. Sorry, the internet started out as a set of distributed protocols. Then Tim Burns Lee did the web, and then there became some, you know, choke points uh, with search engines and social networks. And one definition of the metaverse is that all must go away. And that I think is unlikely to be true. In fact, as people pull back the the covers on on what's actually going on in some of these things, there are people who are providing directories and security and so forth. And those are useful value-added functions. And I think there'll be a lot of competition there. And then the third thing where people would say, make it a strict part of the definition, is cryptocurrency and NFTs. That uh, it can't be a metaverse if you charge something, if you want to buy your virtual avatar hat on your visa card or charge it to your you know buy it in the microsoft store or the apple store or the google store that one i also wonder why we have to be so strict of so that's sort of i think it's very exciting that these immersive technologies video then 3d will unlock everything from gaming to meetings to collaboration uh and i think there'll be variants of those that are in a headset have distributed versus shared services and have traditional forms of payment and commerce versus distributed forms of payment and commerce. But I'm not in the camp of saying if it's not all based on NFTs, it can't be an interesting vision of the future. I'm just never that religious. Okay, so what I hear you saying is that it's already here in a nascent form. 
that it isn't one thing, but many kinds of increasingly immersive experiences, and that these shared virtual spaces will probably be quite fragmented. Yes, yes. And we have that today. We have Minecraft and World of, and we have Fortnite. And do those have to go away in their payment systems and be replaced by cryptocurrency to be, is that the vision of the future? Not necessarily. Crypto is going to be part of the mix, but crypto is not going to replace everything yeah, else. Well, would you say that uh, gaming is sort of the killer app for the metaverse, that that's kind of where it will take off first? Yes. You know, this, you know, if I look back through the history of every platform from PC to web to mobile, etc., people are looking for entertainment and are enjoy new types of uh, immersive interactive entertainment. And so we see, you know, where are people spending time in 3D worlds? You know, it is Minecraft and Fortnite and Roblox and many other things. And there's one new, you know, you know, every few months that seems to break through the zeitgeist and uh, that will continue. And, and so I don't know that there'll be some magical day where those shift from 2D screens to 3D screens and then nobody ever takes off a headset again and it's ready player one. I, I just don't buy that. I think we'll use headsets some of the time. The next wave of headsets are going to be amazing. Uh, but yes, by that definition, the metaverse is already here. And I'm not a fundamentalist purist that says it. We can't declare it <laughs> until it's in a headset based on crypto. Yeah. In fact, uh, we already saw the first uh, metaverse wedding. Uh, this couple in India had uh, had their wedding in the metaverse. So we have it already. Yes. Yeah. We And we, um, you know, we have a... Our big formal offering is called Mesh that we'll be revealing um, this year. But a predecessor to it is something we have called Altspace VR, where you can go to you know, create virtual communities and social hours. And there's all sorts of activities and gatherings and concerts in, you know, if it's fair to call a metaverse today. And I, I think there won't just be one metaverse where everybody fluidly can move between things and, you know, be, with one with one and only one identity, one and only one payment system. You know, I think the world will be more complicated than that, just like it is in the physical world. Uh, you mentioned Web3.0 and crypto. What do you see as the killer apps there? People talk about DeFi and, you know, doing yield farming and all that kind of stuff. Which seems fine, but that doesn't seem like sort of the compelling app to me. And and I ask this question to people, and I sort of have my own thoughts on it. But I'm just curious, what, what do you think? Is there a killer app there? I personally don't live in that space as much as others who are much thoughtful, much more thoughtful on it. And I've heard both sides, everything from Web 3.0 is bullshit to, uh, you know, Crypto is going to eliminate these toll takers who uh, extract, uh, you know, really unnecessarily value out of the global economy. And, and so I think it's early and there's going to be a lot of iteration and experiments. I do, like at the risk of being a little bit controversial, and again, more my view than others is whether it's crypto or not, I think we've seen in the history of the world unrelated, sorry, unregulated currencies and financial markets have occasionally led to serious, serious problems that had ramifications for all of society. So it is good to have these discussions and be somewhat careful about it. And I know that the purists would say, well, that was because those financial markets or those currencies were manipulated by somebody like some king who wanted to inflate his currency to go you know, start a war or something like that. And these systems are inherently prevent that. And I'm not so sure I buy that. So I'm, I am, I think it's good to see all the iterations on these things. There are some aspects of these things, the like NFTs that remind me of the finance classes I took at NYU that studied bubbles. Uh, and uh, bubbles are bad. <laughs> 
Indeed, indeed. Um, yeah, and I and I this this certainly feels like a bubble. But you know, the thing about bubbles is that you kind of uh, you get into this sort of FOMO mindset, right? That oh, I, I know it's happening, but it could go on for a long time, and uh, you know, I don't want to miss it completely. Yeah, but when uh, something has no intrinsic value that you can ground things in, uh, and uh, whether it's a st- you know, what, what is worse, a single person manipulating it or the madness of crowds driving it up? Both are actually bad. And so you need some mechanisms and education to say, what is the intrinsic value here? How much do we want to regulate this? How much transparency do we need? So again, this is where I'm probably not espousing the, the uh, not this is Jeff's view, not the Microsoft view. Uh, but I do think the discussions, the, the passionate debates here are really healthy. Both sides should weigh in. But I'm probably in the camp of uh, bubbles and speculations and, and eliminating all regulations are just a little bit too idealistic. Uh, and we need, you know, especially in financial systems where, you know, we've seen this in, you know, when uh, options and futures were invented and the options valued, or the futures value traded in marketplaces became many, many times more than the actual assets that they were uh, derivatives of. And so I just think we sh- it's, and this is where you and your peers and academia can keep us grounded on what did we learn before? What's different this time? What are the pros and cons of different regulations? Will markets regulate themselves? Where does you know where there's all this debate's great. We should have these debates. Indeed, yeah. No, it's it's a. I, I find the space absolutely fascinating. You know, as as someone who's sort of grown up with tech, um, you know, I I just I, I find three three of sort of both fascinating and scary. Um, and you know, I, I teach a class on systematic investing, and almost all my students, you know, trade crypto. And, you know, the message I'm getting sort of from under the hood is that it's just completely Wild West out there because the regulators haven't really even started shining much of a light on some of these exchanges. So, yeah. you know, but then it's, the, but it's, you know, it's not that different from what was going on in the 80s and 90s. You know, I mean, there's people who get into a space and understand it, you know, quickly and, uh, you know, then in a position to sort of, I, I guess create the hype, manipulate, and, and benefit. It's, so it's, yeah, no, it I, seems like it's. I I had a friend's uh, son who worked at Microsoft that I talked to who left Microsoft a little while back and started a uh, crypto exchange and paid his employees in crypto, and you know you you watch the currency that they were the you know, one of the biggest exchanges for Vala go up and down. You watch their value as an exchange go up and down. And it just, because it's not grounded in something intrinsic, it all seems a little bit fragile to me. Indeed, yes. Uh, That's a good way to put it. I want to touch on a couple of other things in in the time that we have left. Recently, big tech, you know, have been sort of the bad boys, but Microsoft seems to have stayed relatively clear, right? I mean, I haven't seen Microsoft on the hot seat in Capitol Hill, but the other major tech companies have been sort of on the defensive. What is it about Microsoft that has allowed it to stay out of that sort of unpleasant spotlight? I think the main thing is humility. Because we've been around for a while, and we had our challenges, I think a lot of us have seen that if you don't approach the world and your company with the mindset of you're operating in an economic system that is only stable if it creates wealth and opportunity and innovation for a broad set of people, uh, you're, you owe your success to your customers and partners and if you're not creating value for them that they feel fair, will ultimately look to move on or be part of some disruption. And, you know, I think I, 
I think this was already true under Steve, uh, but Satya certainly approached it. And if you, you know, just if you just listen to anything Satya said or Brad Smith, who's our president and chief legal officer, um, I think we are clearly, yeah, you know, our behavior, I think the words we say are more thoughtful, but I think it is genuine that there is real humility and gratitude and appreciation um, that I think I, I wouldn't say this in a way to cast stones to other tech companies, because I think we were very much part of it, that there was a certain level of arrogance in technology uh, that just let us do what we can do. We'll, you know, if you're, if you're critical, you're a Luddite, and we're going to create such natural opportunity and wealth and level the playing field and open up democracy and so forth. Uh, that just let us run. And I think we've all seen that there's unintended consequences of technology. It's not all good. Uh, It is important to be part of that discussion. You can't be defensive and closed-minded when people say, you know, what about X? What about Y and app stores and so forth? And it's caused us to you know, try to take the lead in some things like, you know, being more generous for creators in our app stores than say some of our competitors are because we've been through that journey. Uh, And in the end, whatever mix of genuineness or business interest it it is, trust is your most important asset as a company. If your employees don't trust you, if your customers don't trust you, if governments don't trust you. If your competitors don't trust that you're going to play fair, uh, a lot of bad things happen. And so I would like to think we are more, less arrogant, more humble, more graceful company and recognize that trust of our company is both the morally right way to operate and good for business. And that actually seems to flow from the very first part of the mission statement, which was to empower. And I guess that also includes not abusing data, which is something that you know yeah. several of the big tech companies have been, you know, I think, rightfully accused of. Yeah, I think the the reason you see such acceleration of us in the cloud is, uh, you know, we we were on the forefront of building trust. Yeah, you know, we had we gave. You know, when the banks decided whether they were going to go to the cloud or not, whether they were going to pick our sort of competitors, we said, tell me whatever certifications or audits you want, whatever proof you need that nobody in Microsoft can see your data, that the data doesn't leave uh, our data centers outside your control. And just, you know, we, we, we brought in auditors that they picked. Uh, and sometimes they would say, well, we haven't found anything concerning, but here's a control point you want to, you should add. And so we've been part of ratcheting up the certifications and audit standards for tech companies, clouds that I think has benefited everybody. I think we, now everybody has the long list of audits and certifications in SAS and it's helped the market for, for all tech companies. So yeah, I, it, you know, there's a lot of, angles this comes from, but I would say trust is, you know, Satya probably say trust is our most important asset as a company. Talking about trust and, you know, another sort of subject we alluded to uh, in a prior exchange, you mentioned this notion of Hollywood studio models. And, And when I was thinking about big tech and sort of the piles of cash that you're, that you're sitting on, you know, does that mean that this studio model where you just sort of become VCs in a sense and fund interesting initiatives, people, you know, maybe within Microsoft, is is that something that we should expect to see sort of more of from big tech? I think you'll see a hybrid model of platforms and creators. Uh, there was, a, you know, Reid Hoffman talked about this a little bit in his book. But several years before, there was a journalist named Robert X. Cringely who wrote a book called Accidental Empires about the early days of the PC industry. And it was kind of fun. And he, I remember this, this book is, is pretty old at this point, but predicted that. 
And, you know, I think you'll probably remember uh, there was a pro- finance professor years ago. I think it was, was it Robert, J- was it Jensen who talked about the point of a firm that why do companies exist? And, you know, the, you know, how much vertical integration, horizontal integration, what was the value add and so forth. Um, and so I think that constantly gets tested and disrupted in tech. In fact, you know, the IBM PC was made by IBM from an Intel microprocessor and a Microsoft operating system and third-party applications. And, you know, that led to all sorts of innovation. And you could argue IBM played that totally wrong or they, you could argue they played it right but just didn't execute well. Uh, and so th- this notion of the studio model will continue to exist and so forth. But I think if you're talking about things that take a lot of money to build and run and a lot of trust required, say a search engine you know, from Bing or Google or a social network from say LinkedIn or Facebook or our cloud services or Salesforce's cloud services, there's a level of architecture, engineering, design, business continuity, customer interactions and relationships that I think is pretty hard to do and without a long-term, large-scale investment. Uh, now, it will be, to your point, is it a sort of studio model that uh, different bits and pieces are used from different places? Why, yes, in fact, the user experience of Teams and SharePoint that I run, we now build using a framework called React that was invented at Facebook and is turned over to the open source world. Uh, And then we we contribute the tools that we use to manage memory and large-scale web applications. We decided not to keep them proprietary, but to give them out to the world. So I think... At the margin, you'll see these refactorings, relayering, and so forth. Uh, but then, you know, you'll see you know platforms with creators. So you'll see things like, yes, Disney Plus is kind of vertical integrated, where they have this very valuable IP of say Marvel and Star Wars. They want to nurture and protect and invest in and build the brand around. Similarly, we have Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and Office, and Teams, and so forth. Uh, but then there'll be thousands, if not millions, of partners and creators that build content that lives on YouTube and TikTok and applications that live on Azure and AWS and so forth. So I th- still think there's going to be a role for large-scale platforms uh, wh- where it does take sort of millions and then eventually billions of dollars to build and run. And, you know, there's got to be some economic model so that, you know, we get a return for investing billions of dollars in running Microsoft 365 and Azure. But I think it'll be pretty exciting that you'll see, you know, components consumed from open source, contributed to open source. You'll see third-party applications built on this platform. You know, look at the, you know, the iOS and Android app stores. They're similar to what we and Amazon do in the cloud. You know, there's a whole community of creators on those things, even though Apple and Google are quite successful. So I think it'll play out more like that than a bunch of freelancers. So, you know, by the way, uh, something you mentioned was very interesting. On what basis do you decide to make something open source versus keeping it proprietary? Is there some sort of principle involved or is it just situation by situation? It is situation by situation. We, um, you know, this, I'll give you the most recent one. Yeah, I'll give you one that I work with a bit. We have, so the way you do 3D virtual reality web on the web is with a technology called WebGL. Uh, it evolved out of things, similar things like OpenGL and uh, DirectX from Microsoft and Metal and you know, Apple, Google, Microsoft have things in their operating system. There's OpenGL. But the web, clearly the foundation for how you build 3D on the web needs to be in the browser. 
And so we invented a framework to how to make it much easier to build 3D applications called Babylon JS. Uh, and we use that in our own products. We use it in Teams and PowerPoint and SharePoint. So when you have 3D experiences in our web-based applications, we use this Babylon framework. Uh, and there's clearly IP value in PowerPoint. But we thought, gosh, the framework by which we build this, we can help make the world of software development better if we share this. And then if thousands or millions of other developers give feedback to the Babylon team, uh, contribute to the code base, it's going to make the state of the art of web development, 3D web development better for everybody. And so there was honestly nothing magical or, you know, there's like really good tech in that thing, but it wasn't some piece of IP. If we didn't do this, other people would give other frameworks. And there are, there's another really good framework called 3JS. And the two of them are out there competing with each other. People come up with new ones all the time. So we just thought this was, you know, we're not going to make Teams open source. We're not going to make PowerPoint open source. But if we can, developers in this day and age only want to write to a library that's open source. They want something that's they can modify they don't have to give it back to anybody else. You know, MIT, the MIT license is the better, better licenses out there. So that, you know, we just thought it made sense. We would gain from it. We could contribute something to it. And they're just the expectations for modern developers is developers don't want to write to proprietary frameworks that they can't see the source code for. So, you know, those are the rules. We, we you yeah, know, we have to live by them. Yep. Yep. Nope. That makes, uh, makes a lot of sense. So, Jeff, uh, before we wrap up, what uh, is your advice to young people these days who are getting ready to enter the workforce? I would just say learn as much as you can from as many people as you can. It's very easy early in your career to do what I did and what I see other people do is just feel so heads down by your, your, your current work that you don't pick your head up and network and learn from everybody. I think... I think that the places where I have the biggest regrets in my career is when I didn't open up and assimilate enough stuff from what else was going on. And the places I feel most proud was when I looked at some idea inside the company, outside the company, synthesized them together, and we did one plus one equals three. You, of course, you don't want to be bouncing off the wall, learning all sorts of things and never get any work done. And so, you know, I would say that's the second thing, which is... Find somebody inspiring to work for who can help you get clarity on what impact you're having. If you're not inspired by your manager in 2022, you have a lot of other choices. Uh, so go get somebody who inspires you and helps you say, like, answer the whys and what's for you. What am I building? What, how's it contributing to the company? How's it contributing to the customer? So those would be the two things. Like, uh, don't go to either extreme of bouncing over the wall or being completely heads down. Deliver some stuff that's got value, but make sure you have enough time in the day to network and learn. Thanks for that, Jeff. You know, it uh, it reminded me of a quote that I wrote down from uh, Reed Hoffman's book, which is Teddy Roosevelt's quote, which is far and away the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at something worth doing. And I And I think... To that you're you're adding with people who you find inspiring and and a chance to learn along the way because if you try to if you if you expect in any organization today the rules of the game to stay constant for the next decade you're going to be disappointed <laughs> indeed indeed well jeff thanks so much uh for uh sharing your time and expertise i really appreciate you uh coming on the show Thank you so much. This was very fun and love to uh, hear the feedback from your from your listeners and, and do it again maybe sometime. For sure. 